So welcome everyone for the second talk of this, uh, I mean, of this contributed talk session. So for this talk, uh, we have uh, Caleb Parks from University of Arkansas. So he'll talk about a voltage type operators on hard disk spaces. Oh. Please. So, so, sorry, technical issues. One second. Uh, what's going on? Uh, one moment, sorry. <laughs> Oh, okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Okay. okay. All right. So obviously, I've given this uh, given this talk before. So should be uh, let's see the correct like, date here. All right. So today I'll be talking about uh, <clears throat> operator introduced by I think introduced by Nicholas uh, Chalmukas and his advisor. Um, I think. So it's a basically a generalization on the Volterra top opera, uh, type operator. First, I want to acknowledge my wife and uh, for helping me to um, uh, make this presentation and my friend Men for some nice discussion. All right, so first some definitions, uh, P0, P1, and P, uh, Q0, Q1 will denote some real number in interval zero to infinity, could possibly be infinity. Uh, S prime will denote the uh, dual exponent of S uh, whenever S is not zero. So we'll be doing uh, kind of duality for a negative exponent at some point. Uh, D will denote the unit disk, and a pseudo hyperbolic disk will be uh, denoted by D of the R, where, where this is the nice uh, Mobius transformation that uh, I'm chosen as my pseudo hyperbolic distance. And finally, for brevity, we'll denote a set of analytic functions by H. All right, so, so then uh, people know the Hardy space. Um, <clears throat> so we're, we're just going to put that definition there. And then uh, my normalization for Bergman space may be uh, different from other people's. I just chose this normalization for, uh, for making the theorems look a little bit nicer. Um, and actually we're defining the anti-differentiation operator, just integration from zero to C. We'll use this operator to find the uh, Voltaire operator. And finally, for an analytic space X, we'll just define U of X to just be those functions vanishing its origin with degree one, let's say. So, so the order one or more could be. All right, so what is the kind of classical Voltaire operator? It's not really classical, it's already generalized. But the idea is that we, we take a function G, take its derivative, uh, apply multiplication, and then apply anti-differentiation. And this has been studied at least, uh, uh, goes by, I think, Volterra to, to find this operator. Uh, there was no G, G was just identity, I believe. Uh, but then this uh, theorem, uh, this operator has been studied between many spaces, uh, Lima, uh, Element, and uh, Sima in 2001, considered this Volterra operator acting between Hardy spaces. Uh, then they got some characterizations depending on the relative sizes of P and Q about when this guy is founded. Uh, then uh, Hugh in 2004 did a similar idea, but now considering the, the Bergman spaces. And if you compare these, they're very similar, HP and AP, BMOA and the block space, and then these growth spaces, and even the exponents are analogous. Uh, then uh, later on, let's see how to go next. Then later on, uh, people decided to study between Bergman space and Hardy space. And I believe also from Hardy space to Bergman space has been uh, been uh, discussed, but mainly the point I wanted to point out here is um, how complicating the characterization is. So, uh, based on how P0, P1, and uh, 2, and all of them relate, then you have four four different characterizations. And um, one thing I want to point out is that my my tenth space naturally pops up in uh, one of the in one of the characterization of this result. So 10 spaces, which we'll uh, briefly talk about, do occur naturally in the wild. Um, and, and there's a natural reason for that. All right, so now we, let's go ahead and define our operator. So we'll take, um, this should be a tuple here. Sorry, typo again. I thought I fixed this typo. So we'll take a tuple lambda zero through lambda n. And if we take two holomorphic uh, functions g, we can define the Volterra operator 
nth order Voltaire operator to just be the following uh, sum of multiplication operators together with some coefficients. And then we'll just anti-differentiate n times. And so this is essentially, um, uh, it could be thought of as generalization of Voltaire operator to higher degrees. Right, so then in uh, 2009, in his thesis, uh, Chow Mukas uh, proved the following result. Uh, if VG is operating between these Hardy spaces, uh, there should be some lambda there. Then uh, we know when this guy is bounded. And so we have the exact same characterization as in the Hardy space. The only problem was that part of them, it was, it was not completely solved. So here, if uh, P0 equal P1 or P0 less than P1, then we have complete characterization for when this is bounded. But uh, in the case P0 is bigger than P1, uh, we don't know. But the conjecture is that it's in the HP space where P is satisfying this kind of familiar, uh, familiar equation. People have looked into this before. All right, so the goal then is to, to complete this red dot, so if and only if. So here's the main theorem. Uh, again, we remind you this Voltaire operator we just defined. And uh, whenever P0 is bigger than P1, we define one over P by this, this the P by this equation. And then we have the following result. So if the first coefficient is not zero and the last one is, then we have exactly the theorem uh, that he considered. And this is the only case that uh, John Lucas considered, I believe. Um, I actually have a result for when they're both equal to zero, which is an artifact of the proof of the first result. So this comes, this is this one's free. And then I also have partial result in the case where um, where the leading coefficient, uh, the long to zero term is not zero. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to do anything since there. Uh, basically, you can reduce the degree of operator to a, a degree one operator, and then you just need to uh, to deal with that. It's basically some kind of uh, integration by parse method. Uh, but it's coming straight from the proof of this result. All right, so, so what is the motivation for this? Okay, so for, first motivation is given in the paper when this was introduced is that uh, somehow when you have analytic solutions to certain PDEs, to certain estimates on norms, then you can guarantee that your solution satisfies some regularity condition. In this case, uh, you can be assured that your, your function lives in HP whenever these uh, norms of these coefficients are sufficiently small. So that's one reason, and there's other reasons. Um, like we can find factorization uh, theorems for derivatives of party space functions and other things. Um, <clears throat> uh, next is that the Voltaire operator and multiplication operator have been studied between many spaces, and it'll be kind of nice to give some kind of uniform treatment of all of them, where maybe we can uh, somehow hide these details or at least uniformize the proof. So maybe there's only one more, more one proof method in the previous result. In each case kind of needs a different proof, which I can uh, now have one proof. And uh, and also we, we want to, um, I mean, they, these ones have been studied all over the place, so it's kind of interesting to continue. So there's some motivations and can discuss some more. So now I need to talk about the 10th space. So what is this thing? First, we're looking at what's called a non-tangential approach region. This is kind of standard definition. Different people have different regions, but they all lead to the same definition of a 10th space. So one way is you can take the convex hull of, of this disk with some point zeta in the boundary of the disk. So this is just some point zeta in the boundary. And at some point, we're going to consider how this point moves, and then the cone will kind of rotating around in the, uh, in the disk. All right, so here's the... Uh, definition we have for 10th space. Um, <clears throat> so if we have a measure mu, we'll uh, weight it appropriately so that we get the Bergman space most of the time, uh, well, when P and Q are equal. And then uh, here's the idea. So we're going to do a Q integration along this tangential approach region with respect to the measure mu hat. And then we will multiple, then we will take a, uh, basically this is a Q norm over this uh, space, and then we'll let the uh, the guy rotate around, so the, the zeta will rotate around in the disk, and we can take a p norm in, the, in that variable with respect, with respect to arc length measure. It should be a script L. 
And then we have natural idea uh, when Q is infinity, we can replace with the soup norm. And uh, when P is infinity, we, we replace this with some kind of Carlson, uh, Carlson type norm. Uh, this is a Carlson square. All right, then we can uh, similarly define the weighted 10 spaces. So the weighted 10 space is you take F, multiply by the appropriate weight, and, um, and we'll get our weighted 10 space. And we also have 10 space for a negative exponent. I don't really want to explain all this, but the basic idea is that if an exponent is negative, you want to replace the norm, you want to replace it with a growth type norm. So if, if the P is negative, you replace it with infinity and you put the appropriate growth condition on there. Um, so you're kind of wrapping all of these cases into one item, but fortunately that one item behaves very uniformly, uh, even, even with the growth, uh, even if it has different uh, definitions. So it's kind of somehow natural in the context of this problem to make this definition. And finally, uh, if, if we take area measure, we're just going to ignore the, what the measure and just write TCQ alpha. And then the ACP is just those analytic function living in some space. And finally, for the proof, we're going to have to uh, call this block type 10 space T B BTP, which is just these uh, function F so that the derivative lives in the appropriate uh, 10 space. And this will be a block space if you put infinity there. Okay, so uh, BTP, BT infinity is the block standard block space. All right. <clears throat> and then uh, just by doing change of integration, we have the ATPP is the Bergman space. That's why we picked the kind of kooky uh, mu hat. And uh, the, the 10th space, ATP uh, infinity gives us Hardy space. So this is some kind of interpolation type thing, but it's not really because the endpoint for the interpolation is actually this BTP. So it's not really interpolation, but you can think about it that way. All right. <clears throat> so uh, now we, we want to prove, uh, show you kind of idea how how we can prove the forward result. This is already proven, but um, actually in my proof, I need a different result, which is part of this proof. So we might as well show you how to use the ideas uh, to prove this. So we can actually use 10 space methods to prove, prove the result in the, in the bottom there. All right, so how, how do we do that? First, we use the fact that the identity map is an isomorphism between HP and the analytic 10 space. Uh, and actually to using some ideas about how the derivative uh, map, maps HP and the 10 space. So this is where the, the 10 space naturally arises when you start taking derivative of Hardy space functions and the 10 space naturally appears. Um, and finally, and next we know that, that how the derivative uh, maps the 10th space uh, to each other. So essentially, it just increases the weight by one when you take derivative. Again, um, you need some kind of normalization. So this is actually an isomorphism. So we want these to actually be isomorphisms so they normalize so that the value of the origin is zero. And next, we have some kind of factorization theorem. So that says if the weight and the exponents are related appropriately according to these ugly, terrible formulas. Then we have, we know that the product of two 10 spaces is another 10 space. And we have appropriate S and more. And then finally, we have some nice inclusion of analytic 10 spaces. This one's actually not true for the 10 space in general. Uh, basically, the idea is that um, uh, 10 space induces some analytic 10 spaces for some growth uh, inequality. And then you can use the growth inequality Force this contained. So, so these are very similar to Bergman spaces, the way they the way they behave, at least when P and Q are finite. When they're infinity, they behave very differently. All right, so here's the uh, method we want to prove that G is in HP and plus is kind of bounded. Again, this has been shown already, but we can uh, show how to do it using these 10 space methods. The first idea is we want to get rid of the anti differentiation, so we take derivatives and get something that looks like a sum of multiplication operators. So we're calling that thing silver. And then we kind of isolate the first term. It behaves differently than the rest of the terms. Since the rest of the terms are in 10 spaces that are kind of more Bergman type. And this, this one is more uh, Hardy type. And, and now we can use the differentiation theorem to, uh, so we, we know what, what spaces these guys live in. And then our, multi our factorization theorem says if we multiply these, then our, um, our function live in the appropriate space. 
And then it turns out that this space is included in the in the tenth space that we need, which is the oh I have something very specific. Sorry. Uh, and then being in this tenth space tells us that uh, that these this this operator with the summation operator is found. And that, that doesn't really care about the coefficients. And now for the n equals zero part, we have to use a, a little bit different idea, but it's the same idea. We're still using differentiation theorem so that when we multiply this n derivatives, when we take n derivatives of g, uh, we know where it lives and uh, we know where the f lives by hypothesis. So when you multiply these and apply this, uh, this factorization theorem, you can get uh, that f times g to the, uh, the nth derivative of g lives in the appropriate place. And so note, actually, we get a little bit better estimate over here for these. So that's actually a, kind of an important part. That's why when you set the first coefficient equal to zero, or when both coefficients are not equal to zero, then, then there's a problem. And when you set the first coefficient to zero and the last one to zero, you get some different result because uh, this, this is not a sharp estimate, or this one is a sharp. All right. <clears throat> Uh, so, so now we want to prove the other way. So this is the unproven part. So basically, we want to prove if the operator is bounded, then we know we have appropriate estimates on, on what you. So the overall goal is to multi is to reduce the problem from this Volterra operator to a multiplication operator between the ten spaces. So, so the first thing we need to do is we pick appropriate test functions and reduce this boundedness, uh, uh, we, we say that VG being bounded forces a certain multiplication operator between 10 type sequence spaces to be bounded. Uh, then we have a little bit more flexibility. So we, we have a duality theorem for these uh, sequence 10 type sequence spaces. And we also still have factorization theorem. We can conclude that the sequence G must live in some specific 10 space. And from this, knowing the exact formulation of, of G, uh, we can relate the norm of G, uh, capital G, and the norm of the, the function G using the Bergman projection to get some preliminary norm estimates for the little g. In, in, in particular, this little g will have to be in the BTP space. And once the G is in BTP space, uh, essentially, we, it reduces to, it instantly reduces to a um, a multiplication operator problem uh, between 10 spaces because essentially the second summation before the second summation will instantly be bounded so it's irrelevant we just need to study this one. All right. <clears throat> so let's go through a kind of ideas of discretization methods um, I have until 25 or 20 25. Okay, thank you. All right. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we're going to call a sequence Carlson if it's a finite union of superhyperbolic separated sequences. And then for when we have a Carlson sequence, we can define a measure associated with it, which is a weighted sum point mass measure. Using this uh, point mass measure, we can, uh, you, you, and our scheme for creating 10 spaces, we can create a sequential type 10 space. And when P and Q are finite, here's the, the explicit calculation of the norm. So this is the explicit calculation of the norm when P and Q are finite. And finally, we're able to prove a duality result. Um, so we know what the dual of this guy is. And, and it has dual even when uh, even when the P and Q are less than uh, less than zero. So that's the important part where how we can, this is really, this part is really where all of the cases boil down to. So all the cases boil down to this. And then once you prove this, you have to use cases. Once you prove this, then you don't need the cases anywhere. So th this proof is different depending on the, on the case. So the cases are all wrapped up into here. All right, then, then what are our test functions we're going to use? So if we pick a sufficiently large K, we can define these, uh, uh, these, uh, these these operator, which is essentially, you know, Bergman uh, Bergman kernel evaluated at some point, raised to sufficiently large power. 
And if K is large enough, then this mass, this summation mass, which is going to be our test function, depending on the sequence, for each sequence we get a test function, is going to be a bounded operator. Uh, and these R sub Ks are rata marker functions, so this is a random variable. They're kind of complicated. So this, this is finding a, uh, following a standard kind of structural argument, I think maybe first due to, I don't know who did this first, but I know that my advisor, Dr. Luke, and I guess I felt the minute I mentioned all this is joint work with my, my advisor, former advisor, uh, Dr. Daniel Luke. Um, <clears throat> okay, so here's the, the proof method, just kind of fleshing out what the kind of ideas what I was discussing. So again, the first step is to take in derivatives to, to remove these anti-differentiation, but the codomain changes, so this is the codomain. Uh, <clears throat> And now we need to, we need that, we, we know that this is bounded because we're assuming that VG was bounded, so we get this M tilde G uh, is bounded, or this is the same M tilde from before. Maybe I should have reminded everyone uh, where's my, what this is. Um, so maybe, um, maybe I can remind people what this M tilde is, so I have some time. So we have some uh, lambda zero term f and take n derivatives of g, and then we have the rest of it. We're assuming the last term is, is zero, last coefficient. Right, I should have. <clears throat> All right, so there's, that's our M, uh, mg tilde from before. And then we apply this mg, uh, mg tilde to our test functions, and this is going to lead, yield a sequence g tilde live, uh, <clears throat> such that this multiplication operator is bounded. Uh, next, we, we can apply a factorization theorem to prove that this form, which is given in the previous duality theorem, is bounded on the appropriate space. And then by duality, we know that this form is, is uh, living in this appropriate tense space. The S here is because we need uh, uh, you need uh, the S to be sufficiently positive for everything to work. So you need uh, the PS needs to be sufficiently large for this to work. And finally, we get that G tilde is in the, this uh, this space. And now we use basically the uh, the definition of G tilde. <coughs> Uh, to relate, we, we can now somehow relate this g tilde to, to uh, the little, to the original uh, function uh, g <coughs> using step four. So I didn't really want to get into step four too much, um, but the idea is that this estimate on g tilde uh, produces a corresponding estimate on this little g tilde that we can find. And it's that this little g tilde satisfies that the project Bergman projection uh, with sufficient high exponent in the projection or sufficient high weight in the Bergman projection is actually equal to g, the original function that we started with. All right. <clears throat> and, and now this implies that g must be in this uh, block type tense space. And then th that forces the second part of the operator to be bounded. And we can basically uh, subtract them to the other side and enforce that this multiplication operator is now bounded between uh, ten space. And then and now, now the meat of the problem is just proving that this uh, characterizing the multiplication operators. So uh, let's just let me just tell you my characterization of multiplication operators, uh, and then then that will conclude for today. So uh, if, if we have some multiplication operator between some weighted tent spaces, um, <clears throat> then our characterization uh, is as follows. So let's just uh, ignoring this BS operator. Uh, so if, if G is an analytic function, then this multiplication operator ATP0 Q0 to P1, Q1 is bounded if and only if G is in this ATP Q space where the 
1 over p and 1 over q are, are given by these equations. So it's kind of the natural generalization of uh, regular multiplication operators. Down there. All right. So I think that's it. Um, and then there, here's some acknowledgments. Uh, these papers have been very helpful and, and some ideas from there. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you, Kenneth, for this beautiful talk. So is there any question or comment? And also, I mean, you can type in the chat also. I mean. Okay, so if not, uh, let us thank the speaker once again. Okay, so. Thank you all.